You're on the platform 325. My name is Martin Devlin. Lachlan Moore alongside iOS. It's only sport. And in the studio, Brendan Telford. I, I didn't realise Lachlan was German. Yeah, apparently. You, you, you speak German. Do I? Oh, well, I did a bit of German in school. You, you're just talking about how, you know, in all of the years you've been a journo. Oh, Germans. A journo? <laughs> oh, I thought you said you've been a German. Okay, those I'm are looking forward to these jokes. We're expecting. Because they're actually jokes. I'm like, well... No, I was going to have a conversation with you in German. Uh, David has texted, Martin, remember when you used to say, here he is, 27 years in the business. Uh -uh, change that. Yes. Both numbers are wrong. 49. 49 years in the business. Whereabouts are you both at now? Well, Brennan, is, are, you are you retired? You are retired, aren't you? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you actually, you keep pretty busy. You've got your Tai Chi and your golf and everything uh, else. Yeah, I just, I just uh, love... Uh, I've always been into sport, you know, sports since I was a kid, and so I, I just continue to play sport. But you can't play as much sport when you're you know, in your 70s as you can when you're in your 30s or your 40s. Yeah, but I do golf, I do swimming, I do cycling... And I do Tai Chi three days a week. And um, it, uh, the Tai Chi keeps me able to play golf. And uh, the swimming just kind of takes away a lot of the aches and pains that come from playing golf as well. Great. All right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Let us start with the penalty shootout, OK? Now, this is so disappointing what I've witnessed from from Japan and Spain uh, over the last couple of days. So we're talking about the World Cup to start with. We'll get on to Eddie Jones, the coaching merry-go-round, no more sevens, all of that. But... You know, when it comes to taking a penalty, and we're talking about this just before while the news was going on, I look at it in terms of the default mechanism, in terms of just the, the physicalness of it. So it's like when you take a, a goal kick in league or rugby or you're taking a field goal in the NFL or you're, t or you're hitting a first serve. If you've got your first serve and you've got that one down the line that you save for the ace you need on those special points, right, when you take a penalty, surely that is the way that you've got to approach it. You take it a thousand times. It takes three steps. Bang, you put your laces through it. It goes into the top corner nine times out of ten. That's how David Beckham, he said, to get free, to hit free kicks like I do, you have to hit them yeah, 20,000 times. But Neymar, Neymar yesterday destroyed your uh, theory, didn't he? Well, he can because he's got a special skill. He's able to steer the goalkeeper's eyes and see where he moves. He was like a kid tiptoeing on Christmas Eve down the stairs to get his presents so his parents couldn't hear him. Mm. And tip, to, 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 gone. Yeah, but look at how most of these guys, especially the Spaniards and the Japanese, took them. They are soft penalties. Yeah. They basically look but, as though they're passing I, I it think, to the keeper. I th no, I take a different take. I think it's all in the body language of the of the, of the the kicker. And when I looked at those Spanish players today, I could see, during, particularly during that extra time, that they had no conviction, they had no purpose, they didn't know what they were doing. They were just, I suppose, doing what their coach and manager had told them, just hang on to the ball. And so they hung onto the ball yeah, for 30 tick minutes. Ticket, 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 Thinking that, that we can outshoot these guys in a penalty shootout. But each one of those guys that walked up those three Spaniards, you could see their body language that they were beaten before they even kicked the ball. And the other thing is, my son pointed out to me this morning, he said, Dad, that goalkeeper, the. Moroccan goalkeeper plays for you know for Sevilla in the uh, La, Liga. La Liga, so he knew every one of those guys. Yeah, you know, of and course. so he knew that Devlin likes to go right. That's it. Lachlan likes to go left. Yeah. Um, Telford goes straight down the goes middle. Straight down the middle. He yeah. read them like a book, yeah. didn't he? Of course. And look, and that's look. They do the so study. So it's the body language, I think, is but, important. But you know, if but more than anything, though, if you don't welly it, you know, look, I look at it. If all of those guys, Brennan, if the ball came to them in the penalty spot during a game, during a live game and there was an open goal, they wouldn't pass no, it into the goal. Exactly. They no. would thump it into well, the goal. Which is what the um, Moroccans were doing, weren't yeah. they? I think it was the, maybe the second uh, kick they took today. The guy just went straight down the Belted middle at 100 miles That's an hour, it. and the goalkeeper was nowhere. Well, the yeah. goalkeeper's, yeah. you know, Peter Schmeichel said it the other day when he was talking with Gary Neville, um, you know, that he actually gets it, I don't know, this is weird, but he gets it in his mind. He goes, I'm going to dive right the first two, then left, then right. <laughs> and he does this kind of pattern, thinking that I might get yeah, lucky. Might get 50 I might get 50%. I might get lucky. Yeah, yeah. All right, so what we've done is we've gone through a few. Ivan Vissilich yesterday talking about penalties. I saw Neymar score a penalty and just slide it and really slowly, but the keeper went the other way. Imagine if the keeper went the same way. So, yeah, look, I don't know. Are they bad penalties or was the keeper chosen the right way? So I think it's a little bit of a combo, you know, to be honest. A little bit of a combo. You can you can potentially just smash them as hard as you can. But, look, I don't know. Look, if the keeper, if the keeper picks the right way, you, you can always be in trouble. Chris Jones. They were fantastic, weren't they? Some of them actually were going to roll into the goal if the go goalkeeper hadn't been there. They were kicked so softly. Dennis Katsanos. You pick the spot. And you bury it, and you go low. You give it everything. Um, yeah, you don't change your mind halfway through. You don't do any bullshitty, fancy, I'm going to do a semi-step or whatever, show-offy thing. Um, you just get into it, you put it away, 
you walk back to halfway and your team wins. Fred de Jong. Hit it hard at least. At least hit it hard. Or wait until the last, last second. Winton Rufer used to do that as well. It was, it was, it was just it was lovely to watch when you see someone who's really good at that. Just be able to wait and wait and wait and wait and watch the keeper. And then we keeper puts his weight on one foot, hit it in the other corner. Most people, most people don't have you know that level though of confidence and everything else. Okay. Do you, do you know? And I imagine there are stats around if you dig deep enough. Who would have the best conversion record of? Premier yeah, I do. League? Okay. In the in the English Premier League, yeah. it was a guy called Matthew Lertizio who played for Southampton yeah, his whole career. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. He used to score spectacular goals. Yeah. Never really played. I think he was thirty nine out of forty or forty nine out of fifty or something like that. Eric Cantona. Every single penalty he took, he missed one for Man United, which rolled past the post. But every single penalty, other than that, he got, and the keeper went the other way. So he used to sit there and wait to see which way you died. Yeah, then go. Okay? Yeah. There's a guy called Jerry Daly for Man U who was absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't know what Salah's conversion rate is. I mean, there are some, you know, I've always read the stats when I was growing up, you know, reading shoot magazines and that, that you have to get eight or nine out of ten. And, wow. and, and, wow. and, and as far as United were concerned, Alex Ferguson always said that you're allowed to miss... Well, you're not allowed to miss, but if you miss two, the next guy has a go. Mm. So there were several players in the team that were capable of taking them. If you miss two, you, you, your and second so, one, someone and, else catches And they still them. see them. Usually the, the best guy goes first, does he? Well, Ronaldo always used to go last because he liked the glory of actually winning it. <laughs> okay? oh, yeah. But, you know, we talked about this yesterday. Go back to the 1994 World Cup, Brendan, where Baggio skied it over the bar yeah, and everyone yeah. blames him. The Italian captain missed the first penalty in that shootout. So, but no one remembers that. You know, so if it was me, I always go first, just in case you blow it. And, and if, if the first guy misses, it just puts so much more pressure. kind of pressure on yeah. everyone else who's starting to panic as they walk up. So, it, I mean, it's the most brutal ritual in sport, in all of sport, isn't it? But tell me a better way to decide a quarterfinal no, or a exactly. semifinal. You yeah. can't have a replay, but, mm. you know, because you know that means that they've played an extra game than the other yeah, team that yeah, they're going yeah, to play. Yeah. 120 minutes. I read a uh, quote from Sam, a tweet from Sam Neill. To, uh, yes, Sam. Sam Neill, the actor today, yeah, yeah. and he was saying, oh, you know, they're, they're terrible. And I, I replied to him and I said, look, figure a different, better way out of doing it. After 120 minutes, it still requires skill and nerve to do it. And you've got to have, you you've got to have, you know, what, well, what, what, you know, they've Spain did this this morning, mate. They brought two subs on. Yeah, Those, I know, yeah, they brought yeah. two, you can't tell me that in a lineup of my favourite five penalty takers, I've picked two substitutes well, to I thought take when penalties. they came on, they, that must be their speciality, which I suppose is a tactic which some coaches or managers would use as well. Bring on your best shooters if you've rested them and to make sure they're on when the extra time finishes. But um, the only uh, the only possibility is a, is a leaf, if you like, out of, dare I say, softball's uh, book, when they go into extra time, they shed players every few minutes, right? So you start with your 11, and then after a few minutes, you're down to 10, 9, 8, 7. Eventually, goals will be scored. Okay, does that mean that first goal wins it? Because they well, did bring in golden goal. They had golden goal at the yep. Euros in 2000. Yep. They had them at the World Cups, and they threw that out because they just thought it was too random. Well, I think what you would do, I'd drop this meaningless 30 minutes of extra time for a start-off and radicalise the actual... Uh, method that is used to determine who's going to win by shedding players. You start with your full complement and then every couple of minutes <laughs> someone gets a yellow card and you get down to a point where you might even finish up one on I don't know, one on one will never come to that I suppose but yeah, you keep going until someone scores well, a goal. Well I like, I like the drama that the penalty shootout provides and as I said, yeah, there does, has to, yeah. there's an element of skill in it, or there's more than an element of skill in it there's a hell of a lot of nerve in it and it gives the goalkeeper a chance to be yeah. a hero, doesn't yeah. it? But it also gives the guy, I mean, you know, if somebody can come up with a better way of splitting it, I mean, you know in the, in the the you know, one of the one of the tiebreakers, remember, during the World Cup, during the group stage, was going to be yellow cards or red cards got you through. There has been instances in previous World Cups where a coin toss yeah, decided. Now, yeah. I mean, you can imagine no, going no, out on no, a toss no. of a coin. Uh, no, that's right. It's, it's a okay, coin. so let's go through the teams now. You've got four quarterfinals. Once again, you've got five teams from Europe, two South Americans, and you've got an African team in there. Yeah, so yeah. what Africa and the Asian confederations, they're trying to inch teams well, into Well, it's, 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 it's an African, but it's also being described as the first Arab nation. Yeah, good point. Because it's, it's their, Morocco. Population, their population is, yeah. you know, 50-50. But they're in the yeah. African continent yeah. now, west, of course. Yeah. But what it says again, now, you know, because of Asia, Set Blatter basically increased their places in the World Cup. This is why it's gone to 48 teams, right, because they had all the money. Um, and now the, the, the Arab countries all want extra places, so that's why it's gone to 48... But ultimately, Europe, who only get, I think, 14 or 15 places, most of their teams should be at the World Cup. When Italy, the European champions aren't there, there's something actually wrong. And once again, Europe get five out of the eight places. Mm. But being a World Cup, this is the difference, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being a World... So who's your team at the moment? Brazil? 
Well, I have no idea. I'm, I'm not an a expert on football, but uh, I, I want Brazil to win it because they epitomise the beauty and the art of football more so than any other team. As someone said to me this morning, you know, watching that stuff yesterday from Brazil, it was like they were just having a, a little game of football in the back streets of a favela yeah, in, in Rio. That's it. You know, that's <laughs> that's where they learn their skills, I guess, and they just translate them and transform them onto the football field. So I'd love to see Brazil win. Um, Brazil, France would be the final I'd like yeah, to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah, But also, you've got to remember that our generation, people, and this is really important because the first World Cup in colour was in 1970. The first World Cup that we saw in this country in colour was 1974. That was the first live one. But I think that there's that romanticism of that 1970 Mexico World Cup of Pelé, the yellow yeah, shirts and yeah, all of that, yeah. which stays in our head. Yeah, yeah. And they, they have had this thing attached to them that they are the birthplace of beautiful football and everything else. But if you actually look at it serious, I mean, in Spain were fantastic. The Dutch were incredible in 1974. Yeah, yeah. The Germans, even though everyone thinks, oh, they play German, mate, they win. Yeah, they Well, they did. haven't they won did. this time. Up until last up couple and, of World Up until Cups, this yeah. time. All right, let's move on then. Let's move on to Eddie Jones. Now, just before we go into the football, can I tell a story about the the bar in Barcelona this morning? There's a great Um, story, people. uh, My son is living in Barcelona. He he speaks Spanish, and so he's a keen Barca fan, goes to all their home games, 80 or 90 bucks for a cheap seat. But anyway, so he's kind of got the tittle-tattle about uh, where the football gosses in Barcelona. He'd heard about this bar where all of the Moroccans go. There's a big Moroccan population in in Spain and a lot of them in, in Barcelona. So he goes along to this bar, but could couldn't get in. There was a queue a mile long, all by the look of it and the sound of it, um, Moroccans. And so being a creative kind of Kiwi, he goes up to the guy at the desk and says, look, um, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I'm a journalist working for an online radio station and media company in New Zealand called The Platform. The Platform, the guy <laughs> said. Are you, are you, from the, are you really from, from the, the platform? platform? Do you know Martin Devlin? From the platform. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, anyway, so they let him in. And so anyway, he said it was just this marvellous experience of hundreds. There he was surrounded by hundreds of Moroccans. He said there wasn't a, a Spanish person in sight. They know to stay away from a place like that on a day like this. But he said he's never in his life seen so many men uncontrollably crying at the end of the game. Wow. And I think if we, if you look at some of those shots today at the end of the game, there were these fully grown men with tears just gushing out of their eyes and down their face. It was almost like they'd heard some bad news from home that a catastrophe had hit Morocco and thousands of people had died, judging by this, the tears, these uncontrollable Brilliant. tears of joy. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, and... Then he said to me, it's no real surprise that um, Morocco did as well as they did. He said, all of those guys in the Moroccan team play in Europe. They're ranked about 20th in the world. He said they have been as high as number 10 in the world. Um, So they're not a backwater of football. No, they're not. Well, I mean, look, the sneer has always been at the African Confederation, the Asian Confederation, the second division, okay? But what's been proven with Japan beating Germany and Spain... Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia taking South out Argentina. Korea Argent- beating Germany, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and Saudi taking out Argentina. Yeah. Cameroon knocking over Brazil. Tunisia beating uh, France. Uh, France. Bra- uh, France. France, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, they're knocking on the yeah, door. Yeah. All right, topic two. Eddie Jones gone as the England coach. Michael Corcoran, who we had on the programme, you know him from RTE. Michael has been here commentating yeah, yeah, rugby I for years. Him, yeah. Okay, his... His uh, his word on the Rugby World Cup. I've always said to you over, over the years that we've spoken together, the only world ranking that counts is the one every four years, and it's called the Rugby World Cup. Everybody peaks towards the World Cup. Everybody appears at the World Cup in the best shape they can be, and all of their preparations are geared towards that competition. Like it or lump it, that's the truth, that rugby is now yeah. a, a quad annual. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that, that is the only ranking. And this is the, right. you know this is the point yeah. about Eddie Jones. Okay. 03, he takes an average Australian side that knocks us out in the semi, takes England to extra time. And that England team was the best team in the world, no question, right? 07, he is the assistant coach with Jake White when South Africa win. 2015, he coaches Japan to the biggest upset ever over South Africa. 2019, he knocks us out again in the semi, but England didn't win it. He's been gearing towards that World Cup. Is it fair that they... Well, I mean, it's fair they can do what yeah. they want. But... You know, in terms of actual achieving at World Cups, the guy's got a pretty good pedigree. Well, he has, but on the other hand, you look at his record this year, I think England had five wins out of ten test matches this year, you know, which is just not up to standard, is it? A year out from the Rugby World Cup, you've got to have a better record than that. Now, paying the guy millions yeah. um, so he can wheel his wheelbarrow down to the bank on Monday morning with a smile a mile wide on his face. So he didn't deliver. At the end of the day, he didn't deliver. And um, he's. I'm trying to remember the guy's name who was at the Warriors, and he told me once on air, and I imagine he told you as well, um, I'm a change agent, I'm a change agent. Who was that guy? You know that? Mick Mick Watson. Mick Watson. They they come in, like Eddie Jones, they turn everything upside down. I think maybe Brendan McCullum might be this as well, a change agent, and they get instant 
and they get instant results, right? Uh, which is what Eddie Jones did. But then after a while, the voice becomes kind of boring and we get sick of it. It's the same old story and they fall away. And I think this is what's happened to Jones. But um, anyway, he'll go. And uh, I, I don't think myself that, contrary to what uh, my German friend next door is saying, I don't think um, Razor will go. To England? Yeah. No, I don't think he will either. I think that, look... They, uh, they've got both with haven't yeah, they? Yeah, they've got both. Well, OK, let's, t- let's, let's talk about that. Because the, the other name that's not in the mix here for the All Blacks coach is a guy called Jamie Joseph. Now, Jamie yeah. Joseph was going to run alongside Ian Foster last time with Tony Brown. And, OK, and New Zealand rugby fannied around for so long that in the end he took five, five times the salary to stay in Japan, right? So everyone's thinking it's automatically Scott Robertson for the All Black coaching job next year. But is it? Well, there's only two, isn't there? There's only it's really Jamie Joseph uh, or Robertson. So, Foster, I mean, so you think New Zealand rugby going to cut him even if he wins it? Um, I, I don't know, Martin. I, I don't know who would know. We're not we're not privy to what's going on behind closed doors. But Gatlin was the other guy that I suppose he fancied his chances, didn't he? I mean, when um, he got out of Wales, his reputation was sky high, and he's always said he wanted to be the All Black coach. Mm-hmm. So he came here thinking that he would get Hanson's job. He missed out on that, and so they sent him into a back room at Hamilton to look after the doing something at the Chiefs. Yeah, I don't know. That's right, it was. Yeah. And so then he kind of thought, well, okay, I'm still in my 50s. I've got another shot at this at the end of Foster's run. And so uh, Foster, you know, will struggle, win, lose, or draw to hang on to the job, I imagine, in 12 months. But Gatlin also has decided, and he said it last night on television, basically, that um, the best coach by a mile in New Zealand is Robertson. Uh, is Scott Robertson. So he knows he's out of a job. He won't get that all-black job. So he's taken the big money and he's gone back to Wales. So that takes him out. So it leaves really only Robertson or Joseph. Joseph and Brown, I suppose, will come as a, as a, as a pair. But um, they've got to give it... I would think they have to give it to Robertson, don't they? But the awkwardness around this... So, look, say, for example... We well, it's work- not really, is it? Well, well, why, why well, is say, it awkward? Well, say we're working in the business and say we're doing the breakfast show, say we're Mike Hosking, we're absolutely su- successful, we're rocking it, and... And you get those ratings, and they've already decided five months previously that you're going to go regardless. I mean, that's not good business sense, is it? What say Foster wins no, that World but Cup? New Zealand rugby aren't, aren't going to be as naive and as stupid as that to be saying five months out that. Uh, well, they, 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 they actually con- want it decided by May. They, they, they won't even. They won't even kind of confess that they're talking to anyone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, look, that's Mark Robinson, yeah, mate. I mean, he wouldn't tell you what yeah. kind of cup of coffee he had for fear but, of offending uh, somebody. But uh, look, this is the list of coaches from 1987, and I just did this uh, before. So since Sir Brian Lahore coached at the World Cup in 1987, there has been 10 different coaches of the All Blacks in the last 35 years. That's an average of three and a half years, Brendan. That's not bad. That's not bad. Okay, so essentially all you get is a World Cup cycle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the head coach. Yeah. That's all you get. Yeah. Shag came... Well, Henry, Henry got more than that, didn't he? Well, Shag got eight. Yeah. Okay. And, and Hen- Henry got eight. Henry got from 2004 to 2011. Yeah, so yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. But... You know, these days, I think that's all you can actually go for. You can go for four years and that's it. Well, yeah, I think uh, Woodward got two years. It got two cracks at it before he won it for England. But um, but these days, would they will they tolerate any country tolerate a losing World Cup coach and bringing them back? They won't. I mean, we're just living in a different no, generation no, yeah, these days, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. So uh, where does he... Look, Scott Robertson is not going to go to Australia. He's not going to do the Dave Rennie. No. Because if he coaches there, there's every chance... It's a poison chalice, isn't it? Kiwis going to Australia. Yeah, well, and rugby, you look at Dean, you Deans. look at uh, others that have gone there that yeah. hasn't worked out. So, um, But, I mean, I, I, I still think, even though it's a largely discredited and defrocked theory in sport, but I think one of the last remaining rituals of this, the jersey, the jersey, I think probably applies to the All Blacks. Everything else in sport has been overtaken by money. Prestige, honour, your place in history, they mean nothing. Live golf and golf. The sort of money England can throw at a rugby coach. But somehow or another, I think here in little old, little old Daryl Sweet, New Zealand, amongst rugby coaches at the top, the idea of coaching a team to win the Rugby World Cup transcends money. Probably not by much, but I think it still does transcend money. And Robertson will make a fortune anyway. He'll be paid millions I mean, I think at the moment, what, what would Foster be on, a million? Oh, he'd have to be on a million, yeah, because yeah. the top well, All Blacks are on Well, million, I think, you know, given inflation and God knows what, and the Ukraine war. Yeah, there you <laughs> um, go, COVID. <laughs> COVID, yeah. yeah. Um, I would imagine that Robertson could probably command anything up to two million. Well, does he need any more money than that to live in New Zealand? And, you know, OK, he can probably make twice as much as that by living, you know, in London and coaching the, the English rugby team. But I just think that the lure of that All Black jersey wedged to the Rugby World Cup still will prevail.
Is there a nice Not way... Not convinced? Is there, well, I'm just, I just... My thing is, is there a nice way of doing this? Because for all of the public fluff and guff you get, Foster and Robinson don't like each other. Foster doesn't trust him. How could you trust a guy that's flown to South Africa to stab you in the back and, and, and sack you, and then all of a sudden, because you win a test yeah, match... Yeah, but I mean, turns, you know, when a guy's getting paid a million dollars, he's got he's to learn, and he's got to be mature enough, and he's got to be strong enough to take a few slings and arrows around him. You know, you're not getting paid a million bucks just because you're a nice-looking guy and we, you know, and we, we, we think you're ideal for the job. No, he's got to... He, you know, he's, he's got to live with all this sort of stuff. And same with the next coach. You know, I mean, for all we know, Robertson might struggle in his first oh, year with the All Black coach. Okay. Then what happens? Do you honestly think that Scott Robertson, you're on the platform, people, and Telfer's with us till, till far four. Do you Courtesy of Jay Gay's, by the courtesy way. Courtesy of JK's World of Golf 24 <laughs> 7 at the airport. Buy, buy, buy a box of balls and go nuts. I mean, do you think with this group of players, and me and Lachlan have argued about this since we started the platform, I don't think anyone with this group of players could get more out of them than anyone else at the moment. I don't think that Robertson coaching this particular group of All Blacks is going to turn them into world beaters because I think our playing stocks are low. They are as weak as I've ever seen. So, you know, to me, whether Scott Robertson was coaching this year in place of Ian Foster, would the results have been that much better? Well, it's only speculation, is it? I suspect they probably would have been. I think what Robertson has done with the Crusaders, and it doesn't necessarily follow that that template would work at the All Blacks, but he gets consistencies out of his team, right? With Canterbury and with the Crusaders. They don't vary much from week to week. Their game plan doesn't vary much from week to week, but it works. You do the basic things correctly, creates opportunities, you score tries. And uh, I think that's what he's somehow been able to get from his players. Now, Foster um, and his mates, the guys he had last year, and I suppose to some degree the guys he's got this year, don't seem to be able to get that consistency. You look at the teams this year, Scotland, Japan, Ireland, Australia, Argentina. Argentina, they've all had these surges in the middle of a game that yeah. had often taken them to victory or have taken the All Blacks right to the brink before they've won. And so it's this lack of consistency that I think Robertson could address and rectify. Having said that, we've all got short memories. You know, you look at Graham Henry's record, the amount of times that we got out of jail in the last minute in test matches. We won every test in 2013 when Aaron Cruden got to take the sideline conversion twice. OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no rugby team spanks everyone every single no, test no, match. No. You don't do it. And we forget how many times the All Blacks win by one point in the well, last minute, OK? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not... I mean, there's no genius coach I mean, here who's much better than everyone else. Yeah, I don't I mean, believe. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a fierce critic of Foster. I, I think um, it was terribly disappointing what happened in the last nine minutes of that match against England. And furthermore, you look at that record of England's. They've only won five out of ten matches. And to sort of rub salt into our wound, um, they drew 25 but all with the All Blacks. whose fault was that? You had Sam Whitelock out there. You had Mawanga out there who couldn't find touch. You had TJ putting up a box kick he, with Costas. He picks them. You had Adi Savia. But who else are you going to pick? Who's better than those guys? Well, we don't know because he hasn't played anyone else. But um, Well, yeah, I don't think uh, we've got the players, mate. Yeah. I mean, you look, at, you look at that All Black 15 squad and the All Blacks, Tell me names in there, there that should yeah, be but when, but when they were good this year, they were brilliant. That match in Johannesburg against the Springboks. Yeah, there was Australia sneaking home with a 34-31 against Wales. The All Blacks ran up 50, 55 five, points, five yeah. points against them yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, true. Um, and so when they were good, they were as good as anyone in the world. It's a pity we haven't played France this year. That's the yardstick, I suppose, now. I guess we'll obviously play them next More year. More cap, yep. yeah. Yeah, but um, so uh, I have some sympathy for Foster. I, I'm... Um, I'm pleased they've hung on to him and uh, they're going to live or, or die by Foster next well, year. Well, should Mark Robinson, if Foster goes, he should go. That's my thing. I mean, because I think he's the most ineffective CEO we've ever had, mate. He's a you're KPI box stick and butt yeah, cover. Are you going to judge a person on their basis of one decision in one area? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm judging on everything. NPC stuff, they're no crowd. Super Rugby has lost all their audience. What about women's rugby this year in New Zealand? Does, well, he, does he not get some credit for that? No, that's a World Cup. I mean, it's a World no, no, Cup, no. Brendan. There were 46,000 people at Eagle sure, Park a couple a of weeks Cup. ago. They were local people, well, New let's, Zealanders. Yeah, let's see whether or not, because that's because the Black Ferns were a New Zealand team playing in a World Cup. Yeah. Let's see what happens next year when the Black Ferns play. Are 40,000 turning up to watch us thrash Australia? Well, I don't think we can even get 40,000 to watch the All Blacks play at the moment. So, um, uh, you know, NZR, I think, have done a pretty good job, haven't they, as a partner in the Women's uh, Rugby Jeez, World guess Cup. guess he's getting Mark Robinson on for an interview next week, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. Bears Ball resurrecting uh, yeah, Test yeah, Cricket? Okay, I want to talk about that, okay? Yeah. Because oh. Brendan McCullum is coming, and remember, the first tests were against us, and yeah. we absolutely just, we shot ourselves in the foot in those years. Three out of three. Absolutely, and yeah. tests we could have won. But this test match in Pakistan, this idea that Ben Stokes says, we would rather lose it, having a go yeah, at winning, yeah. winning it. 
Yeah. Is that, no, I mean, it's great. I love that. You love it? Thought, yeah. In fact, when he declared the other night when I was watching that match, they were 264 for seven from 35 overs. Yeah. And I thought, hello, no, this is crazy. You know, McCullum's lost the plot here. He uh, gave he, them four sessions he, to hit he, that. He gave them 100 overs to score yeah. 340 yeah. runs. That's on a dead pitch. On a dead pitch, which holds the world record twice now for the most runs in this test. This test actually beat the previous record. The most t- runs in a test match in the history of test cricket, 150 years of it, was on this pitch. And so he's given them 100 overs to score 340. That's just a tick over three runs and over. And even at T yesterday, they were about five for 230 They were or 95 away yeah. with five wickets, and, mate. Yeah. Um, but so Stokes is the guy that I think deserves the credit. I mean, OK, clearly he... He and McCullum agree on most things, but he was out there in the middle. He had to call the changes, um, and there's old Jimmy Anderson, 40 years of age. He took four for 30 on, on, this, Wasn't it on this concrete pitch. But, Brendan, you were watching it, and so was I, and whoever else was up was watching it. Okay, there's nothing happening with that pitch, but when the pressure came on, and all of a sudden, you know, they were appealing, and... Anderson, all he was doing was bowling accurate, mate. Yeah. He was just bowling and beautiful it was doing, line. It was doing a wee bit. I mean, it's it started to reverse yeah, a little, right? It's the fifth day pitch. So he, I think Stokes must have known that something's going to happen to this pitch on the fifth day. It's not going to play uh, like a runway for the whole of the fifth day. And it didn't. Towards the end of the day, it started to give a bit of assistance, both of the spin and the quick, quicks. But, um, yeah, I mean, I love that comment of his afterwards that he could easily have just turned that into a boring fifth could've. day. He could have could have gone on for 350 and declared and taken Pakistan right out of the game. Yeah. Yeah, but he didn't. He kept them in it, and it was brilliant. And, it's um, an amazing. It's a look. It's such a transformation because I remember, um, you know, so many times I've watched New Zealand play Test cricket, and I've been happy securing that draw. Yeah, okay, yeah. but this guy seems to want to win every single Test match, and I'm not sure whether it's because hey, T20, we're trying to resurrect Test cricket, but it just makes for. I mean, the concept these days of playing a five day sporting match and going into a fifth day, and it's enthralling. It's and, bizarre, mate. And and also, what does it mean for us? that two New Zealanders, Stokes yes. and McCullum, are transforming no, no. world cricket. No, no. No, two, two New Zealanders. Well, you've read what Ross Taylor said about, you know, he actually recommended to New Zealand cricket that Ben Stokes, right? And they just oh, ignored right. him. Years ago. Yeah, no, they just yeah. ignored him, mate. They just yeah. ignored him. So he goes, so we lost him. Um, and look, I think McCullum's one of those guys where I think he's like Eddie Jones, is he'll run out, you know, he'll do it. He's a change agent is what he is. Yeah. And, and, and this is working big yeah, time yeah, for England cricket yeah. at the moment. But whether they can sustain it, who knows? But it's just, it's a different way of looking at it. Look, you but know, those, that, those, that, that run rate on that first day was unbelievable. 500 in a day. No, it wasn't anything like a day. 75 overs. They lost the last 15 overs because of the light. So if they'd had a full 90 overs, they would have been 600 runs in a day. Now, even by, even by um, T20 standards, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, going at about eight runs and over. And same in their second innings on the fourth day, they were going 264 of 30-odd overs. That's at nearly eight runs and over in a the, test match on the, the fourth the day. Great, the great contrast yeah. was, yeah. while this was going on, there was a one day between India and Bangladesh where India scored 186 of 50 overs and Bangladesh chased them down in 47. Yeah. And you just yeah. think, so, yeah. I mean, they're, they're just torturous, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I mean, we've lived through all of these eras where, you know, scoring 250 in the first innings of a yeah. test is a damn good score. Well, I can remember as a kid when I was in my early days, early days of college, 1963-64, we sent a team to England and they had a series in India and Pakistan. And even in the in the 80s, that if you got to somewhere near 200 runs with the bat in a full day's play, it wasn't a bad effort. Yeah, it was a good day. You know, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> six hours of cricket, you know, really 30 runs an hour for six hours is a good day for New Zealand, 201 for seven at the yes, end of the first day. Yeah. And now... These guys got 235 and 35 overs. That's basically a session. Yeah. They got 235. It's incredible, runs. eh? Yeah. I mean, they just, you know, and I actually think to be fair to T20. Who, need, who needs T20? <laughs> well, to be fair to T20, it's actually, I mean, they, they're so confident of hitting the ball. You know, they do reverse sweeps. I mean, yeah. Root was batting left handed. Yeah. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah. So, all right, that is it for today. We've got a musical interlude. Yeah, Yeah. we've got a musical interlude to finish with, as we always do. And you will be back on Friday running the joint. So what have you got planned? Well, I've spoken to a few people. I'm going to talk to Grant Nisbet to have a look at the rugby. Um, I want him just to talk about the the stuff, the technical side of rugby. And I might do Quinny next week. Um, He's very big on women's rugby. You might want to... 
listen in New York to that uh, okay, all right, women's, women's rugby. I love women's and, rugby, mate. Yeah, and, I just, the international and, game's and, great. And, and the the Farrah Palmer Cup had no spectators. And, Super Rugby Opic had no spectators. I look forward to all of those fans at Eden Park attending those games. And he's an angry man today, Corny, because of Sevens. That's his great passion. Yeah. Sevens, gone. Gone. Uh, for reasons which uh, he can elaborate on. I can't quite we'll figure that one out. Um, so I'm going to do some World Cup. Um, I'm going to talk, I think, to Steve Rebilliard on the highlights of Australian sport this year. Yeah, great. I uh, can't think of one, can you? They want a ho- they want a boat full of What'd gold medals at the Olympic. Oh, oh yeah, Commonwealth Games, games mate. They want a bloody and they, TV. And they didn't win the T20 World Cup. <laughs> no, they didn't. All right, the two minutes drill.